You just pressed play on the Last Breath Hunt Cast, home of the Hunterversy. We're here to entertain, educate, and engage. And in case you didn't know, you only live once. But if you do it right, once is enough. Don't waste it. Three, two, one, here we go. Welcome to the Last Breath Hunt Cast. Good morning, good evening, or good night. Don't know when you're listening, but we sure appreciate that you're here. Today, episode 174, we're actually doing something that's really cool. Uh, And it's a guest that you're familiar with, but also somebody that you're not. We are going to have on here Mike Lemansky and his father, Ted Lemansky. Ted Lemansky is probably one of the most accredited and accoladed archers in our nation that really is kind of hidden under the radar. Ted has been shooting bows for generations. Um, He is incredibly skilled with a compound bow. He is incredibly knowledgeable about the industry and the technology changes. So today, we're actually going to get him on the phone. It's probably going to be mostly him having some conversation with us today. But I want to ask him how modern archery has changed, specifically compound archery, you know, and talk to him about the evolution, if you will, of how compound bows have changed so much. I mean, I just know thinking back about the first compound bow that I had when I was a kid, my dad gave me his old Jennings Black Lightning compound bow. I still have it. That thing has got so much sentimental value to me just because it was my father's and I killed my first deer with it. It really is the vessel that transcended me into this incredible journey into just the passion and the love for hunting and for bow hunting. So I I just know that like that bow is so much different than the bow that I'm shooting now and the, and the other bows that are on the market today. Um, and that's just been in a really short span of time. You know, honestly, that, that bow is, I don't know, probably 20 years old now, but relatively speaking, I mean, people have been hunting with compound bows for a long time. So that's what we're going to dive into today. I've got a series of questions that I'm going to ask him and I'm pretty excited about it, but before we do that, obviously, we got to pay the bills. I'm going to make this short, sweet, and simple. This podcast is brought to you by Badlands Gear. They make some of the best hunting garments in the market. Um, I know that Mike Lemansky loves their stuff too. But long story short, if you use our code LASTBREATHBL20, you can get off 30%. That might not be the right code. I might have messed that up. But just message me or <laughs> listen to another one. I'm trying to ramble through this. But you can get 30% off the checkout code. Love their gear. Next is Tompkins Taxidermy. I can't say it enough about how good those guys are. If you're in the market for any type of shoulder mount, specifically deer, elk, mule deer, bear, those are their specialties. Check out their website. You can see samples of their work or go to their Facebook page and you can see what they're doing constantly. Top-notch taxidermy work for the central Midwest. And last is Moultrie Mobile. Been using their cameras to keep tabs on our properties. Deer season's winding down now, but that quickly turns into shed season. So Keeping tabs on those first droppers is something that's hard, needless to say, but also addicting if you get to it. So Moultrie Mobile, been running those cameras, the new edge cameras for a while now. They have a a new camera that's coming out here in just a couple weeks. You won't want to miss that drop. So without any further ado, I'm going to get Mike and Ted on the horn. I'm really looking forward to this podcast. And if you were one of the many people that messaged me saying, hey, we want a good old boy on the podcast again, like when we had Pat Partlow and Ray Olson on, well, here's your wish. We're not only having somebody that's a good old boy, but somebody that, like I said, has been in the archery world for oh so long. He's got, he's probably forgotten more about compound bows than I'll ever know. Hello. How we doing, sir? That was fast. Hot hands right there. Yeah, I accidentally hit uh, and called the first time. <laughs> oh, that's all right. So, how are you guys doing? Doing good. We're watching uh, the Lions beat the Chicago Bears right now. Ooh, well, I know that uh, my brother-in-law, Robbie, is probably a little upset about that. But I, from what I understand, that's been the common theme, theme for the Bears for a while, huh? Yeah, and for the Lions until this year. <laughs> oh, So, which one are you? You're a Lions fan, I take it? Yep. Yep. All right. So, is your dad on the horn? Yep, he's right here. Hi, Garrett. How are you, sir? Yes, sir. I'm doing fantastic. Awesome. Well, thank you for taking some time to be on here today. Um, I gave a brief introduction to our listeners already about Mike and you, Ted. And like, Mike's been on here several times. Um, Almost all of our followers know who he is. Um, We, me, myself, refer to your son as an all-American badass. So um, 
why don't you go ahead okay so why don't you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves who you are what you do and uh we'll get into the podcast all right go ahead dad you can go first okay well uh my name's ted and uh of course i'm mike's dad um been hunting since or i've been uh, shooting a bow since uh well, um, 1955, that was eight years old. So uh, doing the math, you probably already figured out that I'm 75 years old, <laughs> but I'm not quitting. I love to hunt. I still climb trees. If it wasn't for Mike. Uh, I'd probably still be doing this, but I just do it better with being with Mike, my best friend and hunting buddy. So, um, yeah, I started in 55, uh, at Oakland County Sportsman's Club here in Michigan. And uh, I was lucky, I, I took it naturally and uh, started competing when I was 10. And, uh, you know, won several state and regional titles and set a lot of records as I was going through it from eight years old up to 17. And uh, of course we intermixed uh, hunting with that with my father who got me into hunting and I really started hunting when I was 12, so it had been 1959. And uh, you talk about the bows we shot back then, it's kind of interesting. I shot a Grimes bow made in Michigan with aluminum riser. It was about 56, 58 inch long recurve. Holy smokes. So it's an aluminum risered recurve. The aluminum riser on a recurve. I still have the bow hanging here. Um, at my house and uh, I shot that in, in tournaments and my father was a tinkerer and uh, he, he was also your coach. He was my coach too. And uh, he liked to make things. And I believe I was one of the first shooters back before the sixties that had a stabilizer on a bow. I had a 30 inch stabilizer out the front of that bow with a sliding weight on it that he developed. And I dialed the bow in that way. People just weren't shooting stabilizers back then. So when I showed up there with this 30 inch stabilizer, people thought I was weird, but I was kicking ass. So I didn't <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's awesome. So Mike, really quick before we get into this, cause gosh, I'm soaking this up like a sponge. Harvest time outdoors, quick shout out yep. to you. Let everybody know where they can find you. Okay. Uh, jump on uh, Instagram, Harvest Time Hunt, and YouTube, same thing. I uh, have been, you know, I haven't really put too much up this year because uh, because of work. You know, I've been in school for the last year and a half, and that's really soaked up all my time for work. So hopefully that's all about to change here in about two or three weeks. But, yeah, you know, I'm just a guy that likes to hunt and shoots a bow and has a family. Well, yeah, and I, and you say that modestly. And for the listeners, we don't need to get into the weeds of this, Mike. But you're not going to school to be a uh, veterinary tech. The school that you're you're uh, you've been in has been quite different than most people's education. So, um, yeah. But but getting back into this, man, your dad, that's crazy. So he's he probably was. If somebody knows anybody that was shooting a stabilizer before 1959, message me or Mike because I'd I'd be yeah. damn hard pressed to find out. So you were you were really already revolutionizing revolutionizing the archery stuff so did your dad ever take that and try to patent it or did other people kind of see that design and and take it and run he he didn't try to patent that he tried to patent he patented some other things that he had developed and like most entrepreneurs struggle getting anything launched or sold but uh that was his his first and it was really interesting back then I shot instinctive with that 30 inch stabilizer on the bow and a finger tab. And it wasn't until uh, three or four years later that I got a sight on the bow. And, and I didn't know back when I was young that I like to collect memorabilia, but it's been in my blood. So in my hand, I have one of the first target sights ever made. And uh, it's uh, about the size of a nickel, the, the scope housing got an up pin with a black painted dot on it and it went into a slider that's on the bow. Huh. And that was our, our first sight 
I'll send you a picture of it, Garrett. It's kind of cool. Oh my yeah. gosh! No, so the it was the size of a nickel. The site housing. How big is the pin, Ted? It's got to be huge. Yeah, the pin is. Can you see that? Yeah. Oh, okay. the The size of the dot would be a sixteenth or smaller. I would say, yeah. We had a black one, and then I had a colored one, depending on the target I shot at. So things were developing rather quickly then, and uh, compound bows came out shortly after that. You talked a little bit about um, accuracy. Yeah. That's, this is a good point of reference of a person, two personal friends uh, about that and with these old recurves. So a guy by the name of Bob Bittner, who lives in Michigan, he's about my age, a little older, um, shot the first 300 at an indoor PAA round, which is a black face with a white uh, spot in it, Garrett, a little three-inch spot. Okay. Nobody ever put 60 arrows in that until Bob Bittner did it. And, um, and that was in the early 60s then? Yeah. So uh, that would be very good guess early 60s yeah yeah wow so and, and, uh, that mm -hmm. that was the first time and i mean now it's still a task to do that but we see that very commonly in in modern day tournament shooting you know i'm not oh saying, yeah the so, don't miss the x right you know we were just trying to keep the damn thing <laughs> in a three-inch circle which was really hard wow and the last person that i would fail to mention was a personal friend, Roger, Roger Chapdelaine. At the age of 14, he went to the indoor PAA in Detroit and shot a pair of 290s with a bear recurve and beat every man standing there. Um, <laughs> still got the bowl. He was just a phenomenal indoor shooter. Wow. And that's how things were back then. Um, things changed quite a bit. Oh gosh, yeah. So let's talk. It, it started out with three curves that we knew. I kind of knew that was the the baseline. I I didn't do any research before this. I should have. But do you know what the first compound bow to hit the market was? Yes, a bear whitetail. A bear and whitetail. I, and I, my dad and I bought bear whitetails. I can still see it in my mind. They came uh, like a shiny brown, and my father said, "Well, this is no good." So we got out some rattle cans and sprayed them black, brown, and green. And we just thought we were big shits. <laughs> <laughs> we had these compound bows that there was probably 50% let off. And uh, it was fast. It was more accurate than our recurve. How much did it cost when it come up? It was a little over 100. Wow. <laughs> a over, yeah, a little over 100. And, and right when we bought those, that was our hunting bows. And right when we bought that, when I was 15, I bought a Hoyt Pro Medalist that had two stabilizers, one on the top, one on the bottom, about six, seven inches long. And it was a hundred and a quarter. I, I did it with my paper route money. I have that bow hanging here on the wall. And we're, looking at artwork. It. we're looking at it right now. I'm looking at it right now. Jeez. And I still got the quiver where I won the National Juniors. I still have the arrows and all that stuff here. I, I guess I was, I even have the sticker from the NAA back. Oh my Make some data. That is old. NAA started in 1879. And it says right on here, yeah. Our, all archery for all archers, NAA. Yeah, still got the sticker. So that, that's going way back, Garrett. I don't know how far back you wanted to go. But. Dude, this is this is awesome, Ted. We can go as back as you want. Um, so so let's talk. Uh, the, the, we know the first compound now. I mean, yeah. when that came out, you know, it had a set of standards, right? Like you said, 50% let off. Do you have any yeah. I mean, how long of axle to axle was that bow? That, that bow was fairly long. It was probably 38 inches, I wow. would say. Okay, so quite a bit yeah. longer than today's bows. More like a target bow, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's quite uh, some longer. Of, mm -hmm. Some of the things that we, I think, take for granted now that are standards, right? You, you know, all the new companies have launched their flagship bows and, and like mm -hmm. let off speed, vibration dampening, like oversized, really efficient cams. 
things like that are just, they're a normality. But back right. then, like you said, to give our listeners an idea, most modern bows have over 80% let off. Some even 90% yeah. now, where you're saying yeah, you that was 50%. Yeah, that was about 50% let off. The speed was, for some reason, I thought it was about 180 feet a second, something Jeez. like that. No roller guards, no vibration dampening, no single can, uh, none of that. And the, and the, and the um, cams were very small, so they were aggressive compared to these six or seven inch ones we see today on modern bows and guys shooting 80, 90 percent let off. Back then, we'd have laughed at you. <laughs> I mean, you, you, it's hard to get off of an arrow clean at 80, 90 percent let off, but if you're holding anywhere from you know 50 to 65 percent. You can get a cleaner shot. You have to be stronger to do it. But what do you, what do you shoot on your target bows now for let off? Right now on my target bow, I got it at seventy five percent let off, and uh, that's where I'm at right now with my target bow. So it's a little different, fifty. Yeah, and and if I could get the conditioning down, I'd roll it back to sixty five or seventy. Really? Because that's where the accuracy really comes in. No but, kidding. So you're so most of the guys that are shooting pros right now they have a lower let off is what you're saying oh, they're all shooting 60 yeah wow yeah. huh but they're shooting a lot lower poundage normally too correct well what is it I, asa you can't shoot over 60 pounds 60 pounds any of the targets indoors in any target shooting that i'm aware of you can't shoot greater than 60 pounds you can't shoot 60 pounds you can shoot 58 59 yeah and guys dial their bows in so the young, strong guys, 30, 40, 50 years old, they're still, most of them shooting 80% light off. Some of them put these aggressive cams on that they can get down to 65%. It's pretty common. Yeah. No kidding. So yeah. were, there, were there any, what were some of like the standards? That's what I'm, I'm trying to figure out. So that bare white tail, it came out. When they were pushing yeah. that, were they just saying like let off, right? That had never been a thing until compound bows came out. No, this was the first time we had let off, and it made it so much easier to shoot because uh, my 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 hunting bow and my target bow were thirty six pounds and thirty four. You held it all, right? You you held it all, and then with this let off came in, um, it was easier. You know. Now, were you still shooting? Was there ever a D loop when that came out, or are you still right on the string with a knock point and and also, you know, with recurves, yes, you have draw links, but really that's pretty, you know, that's give or take a couple inches. Did When this compound mm -hmm. bow came out, were they pretty specific with your draw links like they are today? I mean, shoot, draw links come in half-inch increments now. Yeah. Boy, that's a great question. I, I, I don't recall how that was, if it was just the same thing for everybody. I really don't know. Um what happened with draw links back then. Uh, I know my dad would tinker and make things fit us. Sure. And uh, I think that's probably how that happened. No um, kidding. I don't recall that part. Um, so it was just different than, you know, no roller guards, no dampening. Um, we didn't care if it vibrated. We were just happy to launch an arrow fast. <laughs> now you know, we could on a deer longer yeah so when mm -hmm. you guys first came out were you tuning was all this is new right so again talking about standards like mike your son is is a, a tinker too i think he's more of a perfectionist than a tinker because that yeah. guy is yeah. one of the best bow techs that i know like when they first came out were you and your dad trying to play around with paper tuning was that even a thing were you guys worried about the timing of the cams i mean all this technology so new how long did that stuff really start coming into play to efficiency of, of bows. Yeah. Uh, I don't recall any paper tuning. I, I, I know we didn't do it. We basically tuned the arrow to the bow. So which he still does today, like crazy, like you've never seen before. <laughs> yeah. So that's what we did then because there was no adjustability like we have on rest today and all of that. Business. You're talking about the rest you used to. Oh, the rest, you know, they just stuck on the side. Of oh, the yeah. The rest was about a dollar and a half, two dollar item with sticky tape on the back and a little hook <laughs> that held my arrow in place. <laughs> wow. 
precision drop away or a blade that's for sure wow huh so i mean that's one thing i wanted to talk about the bows have changed so much and we'll still get into that but the things like that like the accessories you talked about the first sight you know and now today man you look at some of the garmin or the burris sites they're Mm -hmm. electric self-range finding i mean ballistic calculators themselves how 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 long did it really take for like I don't even know when single single pins came into like the dial system. I know forever it seemed like there was a very long time where multi pin fiber optic sites really kind of owned the market. Is that is that true or am I kind of off there? No, I I think back then uh, it was a very primitive uh, three pin site. We we'd set it for a shorter range, um, you know of. 15 to 20 yards and then we'd have three pins we never shot at deer at 40 yards really our sweet spot was 15 to 20 yard shot 30 yard shot was a fairly long shot uh with the equipment we had and we didn't want to wound deer so uh back then we were launching wood arrows and aluminum arrows and dialing them into the bow and basically the way we did it we had a range in the backyard of my dad's house and we we were group tuning back then. In other words, you set up a bunch of arrows, whatever group good at say 50 yards, um, then we kind of went with that. You know, sure. That was our only way to figure things out. Can I add something real quick? Yeah. So <clears throat> let's go back real quick to what he said about where they used to shoot deer. Because I mean, you're a target archer. You always have been, but you right. you're also a diehard deer hunter. Right. So we always plan our spots to shoot deer at 20 to 30 yards. Yeah. And that's how we do it now. But they had to, they, they couldn't shoot 30 yards. I mean, they could, but it's, it's not like it is today. So let's think about like the woodsmanship of them back then compared to now with the equipment they had versus what we had. Oh, yeah. It was different. They, you had to shoot them at 10, 15 yards. Right. And, and what we did, our range finder was pacing off. Uh, to a stump or a rock and knowing roughly the distance uh, you know so so we had a rough idea what we we're shooting at and that's how we did it there's no range finders and as far as finding deer we hunted like indians we <laughs> hunted trails uh, acorn trees and our cell camera was string from my mother's thread tied across a deer trail and when they'd break that string we know it was an active trail uh in addition to you know fresh footprints and so forth that's how we did it and uh we built our own uh stands there was no such thing as as a uh a helo setup or any of this modern stuff today ladder stands i mean our stand if we set one up was Two big spikes with about an 18 or 20 inch two by four, climb a tree, look for three different nail in points, and build a platform. And that's, we sat up there on a stool. We didn't have any safety ropes and all this stuff. We just hoped like hell we didn't fall out of the tree. <laughs> and uh, uh, that, that was our stands. And I can tell you the, First, and I believe this is true, Mike and I talked this about this yesterday. The first climber was made by Baker, and it was horrible. <laughs> I, it, but you bought one. gear. Well, I, of course, I wanted the latest stuff, and <laughs> and I bought uh, bought a uh, a Baker stand. I don't know if you've heard of them, here, yeah. but it was a sharp blade that went into the tree. There's and, nothing that went around it, though, was there? Uh, yeah, it went around the back and had a blade to cut in the front. But the way to keep that thing from falling down was to stand on the front edge. If you put weight on the back near the tree, it would slip and you'd go down the tree. <laughs> so my, my encounters with it were just two. <laughs> I, I'm up about 15, 20 feet in bad axe by my cousin's farm, and the bottom completely goes out. So now I'm hanging by my hand. <laughs> in this tree and unfortunately i'm 20 or 30 years old and i bear hug all the way down (laughs) Uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> that 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 was that. And they actually came with a safety belt. And my other fun experience, Garrett, was I had the safety belt around me and about a 20-inch lead, and then you put it around the tree, and that's how you hunted on the baker. But I'm climbing a tree, and I just know everything is going to crap fast. <laughs> right. Garrett, I, I took that belt, and I wrapped it around a branch, and the bottom hit the ground. Now I'm hanging up in the air. I got to get rid of the belt, bear hug it, and get down. So I'm hanging out with deer life with the left hand, and my right hand, I'm disconnecting this Baker belt. We hated those Baker stands. What year was that? That that was been in the '60s still. Gosh, yeah, so been in the '60s, early '70s at the latest. So that was that was. I don't know if you've ever heard of those those stands, but they weren't. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I I couldn't imagine anybody having many good things to say about them. How about broadheads? No. When you started. Oh, yeah. When you started hunting, Ted, what type of heads were you using? Were they single beveled? Were they like some of the modern heads today? The the most common broadhead, uh, Zwickies were common, and a bear razor head. Uh, Fred Bear was so popular back then. Uh, he lived in Michigan and had a museum up there and everything, and we shot bear uh, broadheads, which had a, a, a blade in uh, uh, you know, uh, like a razor blade cut into the side of it. You had to be careful cleaning deer because that razor head had come out and you never sure where the hell it was. And uh, so it was, that's what we had. There were some other fixed blades too, but they were, and we sharpened them at home in a garage with a file. Hmm. They weren't all that sharp, but my dad was, you know, a handyman and he did all that stuff, but so with your that. with your first setups, Ted, how common were pass throughs? I mean, did deer carry your arrows, or were you still getting two holes, or even an arrow getting all the way through the deer? Yeah, well, I'd say when you're shooting a heavy arrow at 15 yards, there are times we could get we could get pass throughs. Um, most of the time we didn't, but on occasion we did. Um, and today you don't get a lot of pass-throughs with these mechanicals either, but, um, you know, <laughs> if you think about it, I mean, how many deer movies do I watch where this big ass buck's running away and a lighted knock is banging up and down his side <laughs> and the arrows only hit him about a foot. Oh yeah. I'm thinking to myself, is this really good? No, you know? no. And we can get into that too, man. I, uh, I had a, a hardship experience this year and I've, I've been blessed, you know, I'm fit and I'm active and I shoot a pretty, pretty good setup. You know, uh, I'm drawing yeah. about 30 inches and I'm, oh. I got into, you know, slug units of slugs and, and understanding FOC and momentum. So I've built my arrow to be not heavy, but not slow. It has a nice mm -hmm. FOC and I'm pulling about 78 pounds. So I've always had the forgivingness of just a long draw and heavy draw weight. And this year, and I've shot um, two blade kill zone expandables, killed a lot of deer mm -hmm. with them, but uh, I, I really got snake bit this year, and I went back to a fixed blade. And I don't think I'm gonna, I don't think I'm gonna look back. You know, I think the number one thing that kills deer is accuracy, but right. having the forgivingness of of a fixed blade is something that I think I I maybe neglected to look over for several years. Yeah, so. I think talked about that too the uh axius i think it's called helix. the helix oh yeah i just saw that that looks wicked yeah we're gonna shoot those this year that's um, what i shot this year i mean i hunted eight times this year and didn't get a chance to kill anything with them but yeah they're nasty and if the biggest thing i think we talked about this on the phone garrett um when we were taught after you had that deal with that deer is there so many people that say, oh, I can't shoot a fixed blade. My bow won't shoot a fixed blade. It's 100% on your tune and your arrows. Your arrows got to be spined right, and it's all about your tune. Correct. Because, I mean, I, I, I was shooting those helixes at 80 yards, and they were flying like I just threw a dart. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. And that's the thing about mechanicals, and, I mean, you can attest to that. It's, right. Yeah, it, I don't want to say it's lazy. But you can literally screw them on, and they're it's because of the low pro profile of the vein. Right. There's not or the the head blades. Yeah. 
Yep, I, I mean, agree 100%. I mean, and they work, and people like that. But then if you notice, every time one fails or somebody doesn't find a deer, it's always the broadhead. Oh, yeah. So yeah. first, it's the first thing they blame, not the yeah. fact that they hit him where they didn't want to. It's yeah. the broadhead. You hit him in the leg, and all oh, the broadhead didn't open. You know? So, yeah, the fixed blades, man, that's, that's what I saw. I mean, when I was a kid, you had me shooting muzzies and thunderheads. That's all I Well, yeah, shoot. back then... Like when Michael started hunting when he was 12, like in Michigan, you you really couldn't hunt in his age group then without hunter safety in Michigan. So yeah. my daughter and Michael both went through hunter safety and started hunting when they were 12. And uh, it's the best thing that ever happened to me is to have Michael hunting with me. Yeah. And it was something I always hoped for. He was a badass hockey player back then. He liked to fight. I thought, <laughs> I'd have never guessed that, Ted, ever. Oh, no. God. Yeah. The police had come to the rinks, and there's Band-Aids and bloody noses, and I thought, he's going to be a hockey player. He probably ain't going to hunt. Then, then he got bit by the bug of hunting. and That took precedence over playing hockey. That took precedence over playing hockey, and he's just so good at it, you know. Oh, yeah. So back then, yeah. To your point, it was fixed blades, muzzies. Uh, then there was uh, in the later wasp. year the wasp. Yeah. yeah, the wasp was common. Zawicki was common. That long, skinny one. You know, there's a bunch of names out there, but uh, I'm gonna go back to it like you, I think, and uh, just just do that. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing I'm curious, uh, Ted, is is releases like in just in my lifetime of hunting, you know, it's been about, I've, I've been hunting similar to Mike since I was about 12, 13 and, right. um, releases for me forever were always wrist releases. And even more popular was like the wind free flight. I shot that release forever. It was the glove was style. Glove? Glove? Yeah. yeah it's I a shot. glove style. Yep. Um, the horrible face. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It's, it, yeah. You have so much torque on the string, but, but what I'm saying is like in my lifetime, one of the nuances has been like the thumb or the back tension. You know, when I started hunting, those were almost non-existent. In fact, they were, it wasn't even a thing when I went to the bow shops. So yeah. like wrist strap releases, when did those start entering the scene and, and how have those changed? Boy, you know, going back then, that's a great, that's a great question. We hunted, we, okay, releases. We <laughs> shot finger tabs. Um, and it, it was like, you see the, uh, recurve shooters shoot today in yeah. the Olympics. Yeah. We got finger tabs forever. And then we got on to shooting a glove that wrapped leather around your three fingers because it was a little more nimble and quick when you were hunting deer and releases. Oh man. The first release, I think one of the first releases that I shot was the, um, that win, I thought I'd try that. And it's the one like a glove. Yep. We're trying that. Um, you had one of those when I was a kid. Yeah. You still had one of those. Yeah, I, I probably saved it. It's probably someplace hanging around here. <laughs> I still yeah. have mine. Dude, I shot sure. the, the shit out of that thing. It would like, yeah. it, you had a, there's a piece of plastic that was wrapped with canvas and went through like the lifeline of your hand. And then there was a big yep. Velcro strap that went around the back of your release. It had a yep. huge hook and the housing of it, like that attached to the, the string was a big chunk of metal. And I remember yep. one thing that I liked about it is that it would lock onto the, the string because this was before right. D loops and, and right. yeah, yeah, man, I mean, it, it was. Locked on, it had two bearings on the inside of it. Yes. And you'd scoop trigger and you just push it into the string let it go and the bearings will get tight yep a hundred percent if you think about it and you could pull more weight back too with something like that yep that's exactly why i started using it when i was younger because you had that added grip strength ability because you could squeeze it like a like a dumbbell when you were pulling yeah. it back yep sure and all the weights on your wrist right yep yep man yep. It's, it's, i can't even think of what my first release was yeah, my first uh, index finger, I can't, I don't remember what it was. So, Ted, are you shooting, are you shooting like a back tension similar to what Mike's shooting now? Well, uh, he shoots every release you could think of. I shoot. <laughs> okay, so. For, Talk about your target setup and your hunt setup. Okay, so for my target setup, I shoot a back tension 
and a goat thumb release. I shoot a, a true ball Jesse Broadwater hinge and a thumb release. So my strategy is to shoot indoors the hinge, outdoors the hinge. When it's windy, I get out the goat thumb release because I can get on and off of it easy. Sure. If I drive by shot or pull <laughs> off something where I'm blown over in the blue ring at 60 meters, I got to come back in and punch some, some yeah. And, <laughs> and some guys are really good with a hinge better. Maybe archers than me. They'll always shoot it, but it's very common to see thumb releases come out when it gets really windy. And if it's, I've, I've seen Dave Cousins get out of index finger release, shit wind, put a 12 inch heavy stabilizer on it and turn around and kick everybody's ass. Yep. And everybody else is fighting <laughs> 30 inch stabilizer and some kind of uh, hinge or, or thumb release. And he's smart enough to weigh the bow down and hammer the shit out of it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And yeah. By your hunting setup, and then hunting. This blows my mind still. Well, yeah, this this one's up hard. Okay, Michael shoots um, a thumb release, the hunt was. and I don't. I'm still shooting a true ball hardcore, and I, this is the year here. I'm gonna try starting now to put a. I got a Carter just because, uh, and I'm gonna set it up on my. Um, Matthew's Traverse, I'm going to give it a try. Well, I have to tell you, I shoot the index finger like a back tension. So I lay my finger on it and I curve it around there. And when I'm looking at the deer, I have no idea when the thing's going to go off. My right. brain, my brain shoots. And it's so natural to me. I'm going to have a hard time changing. And I'm wondering to myself, even why I should change because I know that if I have to shoot quick, my mind's going to go to that index finger and shoot it. I don't have target panic. I've recovered from it. Everybody's had it. And I had my turn a couple of times. So I'm very cautious with an index finger because you can get jumpy with it. I mean, not you, but I mean me, I can get jumpy with it. So I shoot it sparingly. I say, and then try to shoot it like a, back tension but well, i know accuracy uh i'm going to be better off with my goat or or the carter but i've literally never seen you make a bad shot on deer so yeah i've been pretty fortunate we haven't had any two wild ass chases really no. we've uh, <laughs> he's being really really humble right there he'll always double lung and top of the heart of them and that's it. and he always shoots him walking he never stops him he just no. he's got it down shoots him on the walk and yeah, they're dead on their feet. Oh. I shoot a pocket and I aim at the bottom third, the top of the heart. And the deer doesn't move. I hit him on the top of the heart, and if they dip a little bit, I still double lung them. Yeah, so, you know that's for me. You know. So interesting, Ted. I'm in the same paradox. I uh, mm -hmm. I shot that win free fight for a long time, man, longer than I probably want to admit. And then I switched sure. to a Scott Wolverine release, which is a release single caliper, um, and I'm the type of guy that that I am a gear nerd. I love tinkering and, and, and perfecting stuff. But once I get it right, I similar to you and not wanting to change. If it's not broke, don't fix it. So I yeah. bought, I, I found, fell in love with this release. I bought three of them. I've wore two of them out. I'm down to my last one and I've been shooting this for okay. like three years. And so, yeah. uh, you know, a lot of people that you see, like, you know, guys that, that I look up to, like your son, like, you know, he's shooting yeah. that style okay. of release. And I'm like, okay, I see a lot of the advantages to it, but I'm just so hesitant because like you said, I, I am so, there's no thought to it, right? It's just second nature, yeah. but I know that it's inevitable. This release will wear out like the other ones have just from shooting so much. Yeah. And I'm like, so I'm, I'm also looking, looking into new releases. My wife made the switch a couple of years ago. She shoots a, a Carter too simple and she loves okay. it. She's, she's adopted it and she has no issues now. I just, it's, it's one of those things where, us stubborn mules, we just got to bite the bullet and do it. And like you said, start now, you know, and just make mm -hmm. it part of it. I tell you, if I, when I start now, I actually, what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave my traverse 
set up the way it is. I can shoot that thing on automatic pilot uh, with the um, True Fire uh, Hardcore. Yeah. And I'm going to buy another hunting bow. I'm going to set that up <laughs> with a thumb release. <laughs> that and way you can always go back. The, the bows that are in this house would blow your mind. And I want to just see how it plays out. I know because I'm a tournament guy shooting, you know, thumb releases and end releases, it's my sweet spot, you know. And I just think to myself, why can't I just do that with my hunting bow? Good God, get over it, you know. <laughs> just do it, you know. Yeah. So, so okay, arrows. <laughs> Let's talk about arrows now, Ted. You said that you were mm -hmm. used to shooting wooden and aluminum. And, I mean, mm -hmm. how – you know standards today like lighted knocks those were never on the scene when i first started bow hunting when i was like 15 um mm -hmm. easton had come out with the tracer knock which you'd glued a magnet to your riser and it would go off mm. about 50 percent of the time and luminock had just came out too but those are the first times that i can remember them being around most guys still didn't shoot them though a lot of people mm -hmm. that i knew were were doing like white arrow wraps to kind of see the the arrow in flight you know yeah than they still do today. Yeah. So, I mean, were micro diameter arrows a thing back then? Were big, plump, uh, fat target arrows a thing back oh, then? Just, uh, XX75s when I started. What's that? You want me to grab that? Yeah. So, these are, here's my tournament arrow what from the uh, 60s. And it's probably a uh, six, what's, what's it out here, Mike? It's a, there's this area. Oh, no. It's a it's a small arrow. It is it is it's not it's smaller than a it's, regular diameter arrow. Yeah, smaller than a hunting arrow with uh, four inch feathers on it, aluminum, and they bent, so we were always spin checking them. And then the other popular hunting arrow was like Michael said, is a double X seventy five. Autumn color was very popular then. It was like a bronze color. Now I'm running with that to stabilize it, five-inch feathers. And, uh, um, yeah, that's how that was. And uh, that's Tell them about, about your lighted knock when you were hunting when you were younger. Oh, yeah, our lighted knock, you'll get a, you'll get, you will get a kick out of this. You, you may have heard of it. But somebody did, uh, engineered a, um, a spool of thread yep. that would screw to where your front stabilizer was. And you tied it to the arrow. <laughs> and the whole idea was uh, that's the way you found your arrow and hopefully found your deer. And uh, it slowed it down so you actually had to sight in and understand how much slower your bow would shoot because of dragging this thread around. And uh, I never really liked it. I, can, I decided one time to walk in the woods, Garrett, with the string tied to the arrow. And about 200 yards into the woods, I turned around. I got thread all over Bad Axe, Michigan. I thought to myself, this is crazy. So I had to go back and rewind <laughs> the thing in the back of my station wagon and said the hell with it. Uh, <laughs> you shoot a deer with one? Or you missed a deer with one? Oh, I missed a deer with one because of the making it Beaver drop Island? so low. Oh, yeah, in the rain. You said Beaver Island in the rain. You dug the hole. Yeah, yeah, it didn't work out too good. <laughs> well, hey, you found your arrow though, right, Ted? You're able to walk your string right to it. <laughs> I'd rather kill the deer than find the arrow. <laughs> no kidding, no <laughs> kidding. I yeah. I heard about that, so I've got a really good friend. Um, he's actually almost your age. His name's Michael Crawford. Um, mm -hmm. Another one of those guys that I absolutely look up to for archery equipment. Uh, he's taught me a lot about mm -hmm. tuning bows and stuff, but. Uh, he he told yeah. me about this same thread thing, and he he? he echoed the same thing you did. He's like, I don't know which idiots thought that this would work, but he's like, I hated <laughs> it. He's like, I tried it and just ripped it off my bow, you know. So, <laughs> um, so let's yeah. let's talk about something. Some of your opinions here, Ted. Like okay. today, right now, as it stands, and this can go all the way back to 1960 to now. What are some of the biggest advancements? You know, besides a compound bow, like we're, we're talking about compound bows, do you think have really revolutionized archery? I know there's a lot, but if you could think of like a, a couple handfuls, what do you think are some of the best advancements that have came out that have really modernized archery? And, and it has nothing to do with the bow. 
Oh, that would totally be. the bow. You could say it's totally. it's the it could it, you could say it's the let off or it's the cams or it's the design. I mean, whatever you think. I you know anything from a rest to a release to the design of the bow. I just want to you know you've seen it so much. You know what mm-hmm. do you what are some standout things? You're like man, when this came out, it just totally changed everything. Well, I think you know when you're setting up a bow, the rest is so important, and today we have these micro address, uh, micro adjust uh, rest, whether it's a, uh, uh, maybe a, um, the one that, uh, QAD. the QAD that's designed to, to and it's made out of really nice high grade aluminum um, that fits out of Matthews or a PSE bowl or any major brand. Right, they integrate right in. Micro adjustments and your paper tuning and you can dial it up, dial it down, get your arrow, uh, have your knock trail where it's supposed to be for a bullet hole. Uh, I think that's a that's a big deal. Um, did you ever shoot a pendulum sight? Yes. You did? Yes. I you remember those, pendulum. Garrett? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, that was really a good idea, and it should still be used today. I mean, if you're just a dot guy or a one-pin guy, it's, it makes a difference. You know, when you're up in the tree trying to figure angles. So I, I think for me that the rust is so important because that's where the arrow sits and how we launch it. I think that's a big deal. And of course, what can you say about sights? I mean, we've got micro How long do you used to use for those clump shoots? Clump shoots? Oh, well, that goes, okay. We're going to go back real quick. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so we had fun shoots, even at the Nationals, uh, in state shoots, we had fun shoots called a cloak shoot. I, I don't know if you've heard of them, but you shoot at 180 yards at a flag, and it was so much fun. And uh, the bullseye was nine feet, so they took a, a tape measure, wrapped it around a stake in the middle, and they walked around and picked up arrows. So you had the nine ring and then the red and the blue and so on. And for me to shoot my 36 pound bow, I took a duct tape and a match <laughs> and I put it on the bottom limb and I used to aim with that. Everybody had so much fun at those shoots. And it was lighthearted and it was the end of the shoot. We declared winners and all that stuff. So and, you, you're uh, saying you would use it at the bottom, you would use the bottom of your limb as yeah. that's what that's how I mean we're talking like what a 30, 40 degree angle? Yeah, because it would be about halfway down or more down my limb based on my... It was just a match. 29-inch draw length. <laughs> and it, my dad didn't know what to do, so he said, well, hell, a match has got color on it. So he duct taped a match on it for me, and we kept practicing until I could keep them in the red and gold and uh, won some stuff doing that. It was, they were fun shoots, you know? And we had a lot of fun back then. It seemed like there was less pressure then uh because perfection was not a reality other than for bob bittner uh early on and uh it was a little more lighthearted. everybody tried hard but nobody shot perfect scores right uh, indoors or outdoors like today they'll shoot uh you do double feet out well yeah i get <laughs> you know double feet is now they'll shoot seven twelves and stuff crazy like that Braden galantine and those guys um but yeah that's that's a step way back but yeah that's that was fun so talking yeah. about perfection and maybe a little bit of luck how often was a robin hood back then like you know were, were those were those still a thing or because they're pretty frequent sure. now and a lot of robin hoods never happened in the gold um yeah, we had them, and uh, back then we thought it was such a big deal. You you take it and hang it on a wall someplace. Now today you get one and and you, you wish you never off. did it. Yeah, you kind of pissed off. You blew fifty dollars on an arrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, they happen, but uh, as you can expect with how inaccurate we were, it didn't happen all that much. Um, we got better though, but uh, yeah. All right, yeah. so let's let's talk about the bow, compound bow. What mm-hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna put the heat on you here. What's the number one advancement to compound bows? We're not talking about accessories at all. 
What do you think the number one advancement has been over the last 40 years, 50 years? Compared to the phase four. I'd say uh, development in the cam, because that's the workhorse of the bow, if you think about it, other than bending limbs. Right. Uh, which in itself are very well made today. They don't break like they did back then. And I think the way these engineers constantly make cams so much better and efficient and adjustable, you know, I'm just thinking about Mike's uh, phase bow right now. He's got a bow that comes with limbs on it. He can shoot it at 50 pounds or what, 60 75. or 75 pounds. He can change a mod and uh, adjust the draw length and the weight. And the weight. The yeah, just from the mod. All those engineering things. And each manufacturer has has uh, different things. You know, you, you, Garrett, if you look at Elite, they've got all these fine adjustments uh, for uh, adjusting your uh, limbs in and out, left to right, where it's different with a Matthews where they use top hats. Correct. And, which I still think is better, to be honest with you. Uh, because once you set the top hats in place, they don't go anywhere. Right. Uh, and sometimes I think things could get over-engineered. But I think it's, I think it's <clears throat> the cam, you know, and a, and a good example of that, my personal experience, my Matthews hunting bow is very shootable. My Matthews TRX-38 with that small round cam that's a target bow. It's right. a target, and it's much harder to shoot. So I ended up shooting a PSE with their Evolve cam system, mm -hmm. and it is not jumpy. It's forgiving, and it is smooth, and it really put them on, on the map with target bows about geez, five, six years ago, seven years ago. So I think that whole thing is, to me, the biggest deal i mean yeah you can change the angle of a grip uh you can change the width of how far your limbs are apart and all that but what can you change the most it's cam. it's the cam that's right. the work you know that's that's what i think so w we've talked about how you know obviously all so much has changed and then one thing i think that we keep coming back to is when when competition archery was around and even hunting was around the the level of accuracy was a lot different or i should say the level of precision was a lot different than it is today so right. with the technology that we have you know where do you think the sport is going to go because as as things getting keep getting more and more accurate and more precise and more shootable do you think that they'll have to change the regulations of competition shooting, like the standards, or or where do you think that the sport is going to gravitate towards? Well, I think there's two buckets there. One's target and one's hunting. What drives the archery industry is hunting. It's not target shooting. As the president of Hoyt told me when I was visiting with him at, at the ATA show, he says, you wouldn't have a target bow if there wasn't hunting. Hunting drives everything. That's right. where the rep comes from. In the target category, you, know, you look at uh, the big shoots today. I don't know if you look at uh, the indoor nationals for FIDA, let's say. You got to shoot a perfect 900, which is 90 arrows in, in, the, in the X spot. That gets you to a shoot off with about 17 guys out of 2,000. And then once they do that, they'll have a practice in. And they'll shoot for score at the 10 ring, at, at, the, at the X, you know, which is about an inch in diameter, right? Yep. Once they do that, depending on it's NFAA or FIDA, let's say NFAA, you shoot inside outs. You can't even touch the line. And if, if it's inside out, you get a five, you've touched the line, it's a four. And that's how they're breaking down accuracy. On FIDA, there's the tiny dime size center inside the ten ring, mm -hmm. and that's what is used as the ten ring once they do a shoot down. And you you have to shoot clean. You have to shoot a bunch of those dimes to stay in it. 
And that's how they break it out. So it's so much more. You see what I'm saying? It's yeah. so much more precise. You go to the hunting industry. There's people that maybe don't even practice that much that shoot pretty darn good groups at 30, 40 yards. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. If you think that. And uh, so I think there's less, probably less wounded deer as long as they're not taking shots at 60 yards where they're not Unless Levi Morgan and Chris Hunter. Or Chris Hunter shoot at 80 yards, a friend of ours. Oh, yeah. um, Dude's a badass. So I, I know maybe Chris. less wounded less wounded deer my guess i don't my dad a point to prove it but i think the hunters have gotten so much better um how do you feel about that me yeah um so i think i think as a generally speaking for most outdoorsmen i think every, every outdoorsman again generally tries their best to harvest their animal as humanely as possible and i think that advancements yeah. in archery just as you said, I think it's made it easier for people mm -hmm. to do less work and still be a killer. Um, yeah. But I always think that they'll be, they'll be the outliers. You know, if you think of just a standard curve of data and with deviation, you know, you got people on both ends, like you and Mike would be on the far right spectrum. And then there's mm -hmm. guys that, you know, are on the far left that they bought a mm -hmm. bow. They didn't even know they needed to get it fitted to them. They go out and try to hunt with it, you know, and then there's the mass in the middle that, that are somewhere in between. Um, yeah. I think, unfortunately for our sport with hunting, and I have this question on our outline, you know, I think that uh, um, for compound archery, uh, I think that there, it actually shows too, if you, uh, last year was the first year ever in Illinois state history that compound archery harvests outnumbered, or sorry, that uh, crossbow archery harvest outnumbered all mm -hmm. other archers combined. Sure. So, you know, yeah. forever it was compound bows were were 80, 90 percent of the harvest rates. And then as they begin mm -hmm. to legalize this, um, there's mm -hmm. not an adoption of more hunters in the state. There's actually a reduction of more uh, of hunters in the state. So it shows that more archers are switching from compound archery to crossbow. And unfortunately, yeah. I think that that is going to be where the sport of archery hunting goes, that the states that allow crossbows to be used as legal method of hunting, you will see more and more people switch, which is unfortunate. Think, yeah. You know, and Mike and I had this discussion before, and, um, and I certainly don't speak for Mike, but I think it's both of our beliefs that to harvest a deer the way you want to harvest it, if you do it ethically, I'm fine with compound. I have to tell you, I learned a lot of um, with crossbow. I'm sorry, with crossbow. And I learned a lot about that. I was um, on a pro staff in a local archery shop like a lot of guys are. And, uh, you know, that goes back about 15 years I was on one and uh, shot for Hoyt on a regional thing and all that. And that was fun. And I would go in and sell product. And we always sold a lot of compound bows. And all of a sudden, things switched. And if you were into crossbows, you had trouble. And uh, all of a sudden, the uh, people start buying these. And I, I thought to myself, well, okay. And I thought, here I have... I can't tell you the story, and you know the story, what it's going to be. It, it's either a, a disabled person or an older person or a person that just knows they don't shoot worth a damn. They come in and buy a crossbow. Now they can hunt again. Right. You know, and I thought, geez, this is really wonderful. People 60, 70 years old were getting their crossbows, going to the range, shooting good, killing deer. Uh, and they probably didn't hunt. And then there was smart people that knew they never practiced and they weren't very good. And they'd buy a crossbow. And uh, it changed a lot here. And what happened in Michigan, I was on a board at uh, MAA actually and did a study. And here we had, we, we had 81 dealers in Michigan and I'm staying on the same subject. And today we have 37. And what happened 
is people used to go buy their compound bows at a local pro shop. Well, now with big box selling crossbows, people could go anywhere and buy a crossbow. Right. So the local shops suffered badly, you know, and they, they didn't have the resources to carry big inventories like big box. And uh, it just about killed these guys. That's my personal belief from, you know, being close to it for 15 years. And, uh, you know, average pro shop, they're not millionaires. They're having a hard time keeping inventory and turning it right and making a profit and none of them get rich. Right. Uh, and then the big ones like Shields and Bass Pro and all the other big box, they sell the heck out of crossbows, you know? Um, right. So that makes sense. <clears throat> that makes a hundred percent sense. And that's actually something that I, uh, I didn't think about because just as you guys alluded to earlier, you know, compound bow, it's a very, I mean, I, th I believe it's like an intimate weapon, you know, it's fitted specifically for you. And yes, mm -hmm. could Mike maybe grab my bow and shoot with it? I'm sure he could. And same thing. Could yeah. I pick up his bow and shoot with it? Yeah. Enough to be, oh, okay, I'll, I'll play around. I'll, let me see how it feels at 20 yards. But to have the yeah. confidence of like that you have with your bow is yeah. not something that you can do. However, with the cross and, and so with that comes fitment of the bow to you, which needs to be done by an expert or somebody who knows what they're doing. And then tuning where like a crossbow is similar to a firearm. And, uh, I didn't even think about that, that, um, you know, most, most crossbows are pre-built. Um, there's very little tuning that needs to be done and it's, you right. set it in similar to a firearm. So most yeah. guys, I didn't even, like you said, didn't think about it. Then go to a box store, buy the crossbow. There's no service aspect to it. Nope. And, uh, and the way they go. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah. I, I didn't even think about that. You know, I, I've been thinking, thinking of it, how it's going to affect the hunting industry as, as terms of like, you know, what it's going to look like in several years. And I keep kind of going back to the question of when I was, when I grew up in Illinois, it was illegal to use a crossbow unless you had, you know, a disability mm -hmm. or you were yeah. old enough. So I never even had the option to kind of hunt with one. Um, I know that youth can hunt with one, but I'm just saying, you know, m like Mike, think about your kids. Let's say you want to get one of your kids, uh, their first kill. And so you take them out with a crossbow and I, I'm on the fence about this, my opinion, because it's a great weapon. There's no noise, a little recoil, et cetera. But then you have a kid that's, that's killed, you know, let's say 10 deer from 12 to 15, 16, which by then they're, they're getting to be strong enough to pull the right weight. How do you talk that kid into saying, Hey, you can't use a crossbow anymore, even though it's easier and it shoots faster and, and, and you know, it, there's some better things about it, but you have to use this other weapon. That's harder. You have to practice with a whole bunch to get good at, you know what I mean? That yep, I, I'm sure. not, a, I'm not a parent. I just don't know how, yeah. how I would convince my kid to do that. Like, no, 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 no. You have to use something that's harder and you're going to have to really work at it to be just as good as you were. Yep. I don't, I don't know how that would work. So it's, it's weird. Before we got on here, my dad, my dad's got a crossbow down here. He's fitting the kids on it and we're taking it home with us tomorrow for them to hunt with it. Yeah. But with that being said, when I was, well, when I was a kid. Yeah. That's when you I, could hunt. So you had we had our, we had our kids. youth hunt here and we had a bunch, you know, family farmland that we hunted. And I hunted the youth hunts with a shotgun yeah. and killed deer with a shotgun. But when I was a kid, when I was really little, when I'd go to my grandparents' house, uh, the first thing I would have to do before I could play or do anything is I would shoot an old recurve that my grandpa had at a target with balloons on it. So I was always <laughs> shooting a bow ever since I was little. Right. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I got satisfaction on killing a deer with a gun, especially when I was young because, I mean, it was cool. So, I mean, probably the same way as – you know, with the kids nowadays with crossbows, because you can't, you, you can't kill a deer. Uh, I know it's a legality thing without shooting 35 pounds or above. I, right. I couldn't shoot that when I was younger. And I know like my daughter, she's 12, she can't shoot 35 pounds. So I'm going to let him, you know, hunt with a crossbow. And my eight year old son, um, he just wants to hunt and shoot stuff. That's all he wants to do. So he doesn't really care, but they've both been shooting a bow since they were four years old. Oh yeah, so, I see it all the time on your Instagram. <laughs> yeah, so it's 
I think it's really about how you're raised because I always saw my dad shooting a bow and I wanted to shoot a bow and I shot a bow when I was younger. And then my kids now, like they both have, you know, my dad bought them their first couple bows now around. They both had they two or bows. three bows now they bows. and they shoot. My son shoots a lot. My daughter shoots a lot and they know that they're going to shoot their first year with a crossbow. But I think in the back of their mind, they'll be happy to wing the crossbow and go kill one with a, with a compound. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I think Mike's right. I think uh, for me, um, get a little closer. I think you know, I have the crossbow, and I hunted in a camp where they all use crossbows. And understanding uh, hunting politics, I showed up with a crossbow and a compound. And as I eased my way into this camp with one of my um, professional archery buddies um everybody shot these crossbows so i thought well i got to shoot a crossbow then after being there for about two years i realized i really didn't have to and i sh- wanted to shoot a deer with a crossbow so i did last year shot a turkey with a crossbow and they're so accurate you know uh, 40 yards you can shoot almost in the same hole but real quick let me cut you off real quick yeah he's a person that actually could qualify to shoot a crossbow because he blew his ears out shooting guns so he can't shoot guns. No. Well, Andy's 75. He's, I yeah, mean, but, Ted, you're in great shape. Don't get me wrong, but you're no spring chicken. <laughs> no, I, no, but he's, you know, he's well marinated. Yes. I'm well, I'm well marinated. So my, my, I know I'm 75, right? But you don't my, act my like mindset it. is like I'm 55. Amen, so, Betty. Age is nothing but a number. I'm a big believer. Let in me that. tell you how I feel about it. Michael's got a lone wolf, and he hunts on the fly like that, right? Yep. Well, I have one. So I thought, hell, I'm 75, so I just bought a, a Novix Hilo. Oh, yeah. And I'm climbing trees. I actually just... He still hunts out of a climber sometimes. I hunt out of a climber. I just, uh, in the Everett, Michigan, I was hunting there. I bought myself a, uh, a real nice hang-on. I had some... Uh, um, what those Muddy rapid rails. Muddy rapid rails. I climbed a tree. And hung this 20 pound stand in the tree by myself. And I thought, I'm just <laughs> going to do this because I'm going to do it because for the last 10 years, Mr. Michael has hung all my stuff. And I thought, bullshit. <laughs> I have my old stuff. That's so, awesome. Well, yeah. I, I see where you so, get your toughness from there, Michael. Yeah. He's, his head's about as hard as a concrete driveway. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Little, uh, a guy like Mike. You're always trying to keep up, and you know you can't, but it's just a goal, you know. Like on our farm in Illinois, you know, we go out there. We didn't hunt this year because of my school and stuff, but we go out there five or six times in the summer, and then, I mean, I usually take two or three weeks off, October, November, and my dad will just stay up there until he kills a deer. And we got a bunch of stands out there, and when we're hanging stands, he's always still hanging or handing me stuff and cutting shooting lanes and the yeah. one, I mean, that's how it should be. Even if you yeah, were I 45, I, I should be hanging I up the stuff. But <laughs> he's right. Mike's right. But <laughs> no, I'm hard headed. And I just want to still know I can do it. And I'm not getting diminished <laughs> in my physical ability. <laughs> so I'll be darned. I'm still going to do it. Now I'm going to do it with this Novex Hilo. And when we want to move around our lease in illinois i'm going to be able to do it <clears throat> so my plan is is to walk this thing around my lake enough until i'm solid <laughs> that's and i got until november to do it so garrett um, yeah how awesome a video would that be a 75 year old killing a one six year 170 doing a hanging bang uh, I think cool. that, 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 uh, I hope that happens. And if there's anything <laughs> I can do to help with that, dude, that, that would be so freaking cool. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It, it would be fun. We should, we should hunt together somewhere, someplace, sometime. I'd like to meet you. I think you it met would... him at, uh, what at the Badlands Film Fest at ATA, what, two or three years ago? It was. Yeah. And, and I, I, Ted, don't worry. That's a, those, those ATA shows, it's like a wedding on steroids. You talk to people and you go talk to somebody else. So yeah, I did have the pleasure of meeting you and shaking your hand though. Yeah, that's right. One thing that does happen, you may be able to still hang, hang, hang hangers, but the memory slips, you know. <laughs> you just forget where you hung it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
that's 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 the real reason why you got to hang and hunt isn't it you got to take it down so you don't forget where it's at yeah yeah so the reason i'm doing the hang and hunt with the novik silo <laughs> is because michael is going to hunt out of a saddle oh, so yeah. we're shooting video in my backyard on one of my trees using a saddle and there's several different checkpoints you got to go through or you're going to hit the ground no oh, yeah thought, oh, you know i can hang on i can use sticks I'm going to miss a move and it's going to be ugly. So I'm not doing a saddle. I'm going to do a hanging man. You did so shoot out of them. I did shoot out of it. It's really nice. But man, if I just missed one move because of my memory, it'd be really bad. Yeah. I'd yeah. Struggle. Yeah. That's actually a good video, too. Yeah, that would be a good video, <laughs> actually. All right. So, Ted, uh, so, so one of the things that we do here is I do a would you rather segment. And I want you and Mike to both answer these. You can get into it or you can just say one or the other. But I'm going to hit you with a couple of them, okay? Yeah. So, Mike and Ted. Yeah. You, I, I, you don't know anything else about the bow or the arrow. Nothing, this, nothing. But it's a compound bow. Would you rather shoot it? A shoot a compound bow that shoots an arrow 400 feet a second or an arrow that has 400 units of slugs of momentum. 400. Explain that. So momentum, you have kinetic energy, and then momentum is a measurement that's um, – that's uh, it's a measurement of how much the arrow will pull through. So when I got mm -hmm. into the weeds about that, I, I maybe should have changed the question a little bit. So it's like 400 feet a second that fast or 400. It's uh, it's called slugs is the unit of momentum. So kind of like grains, it's, it's the, uh, the pass through capability for all intents and purposes. And 400 is uh -huh. a pretty good number. And we're shooting a compound. Yes. I'd go with 400 slugs momentum because that arrow What's the arrow weight? No, no, no man, that's not telling you. Okay. Cause, yeah. Because the 400 that... feet a second, you know, I don't know. Maybe it's a heavy arrow. I don't know if that's possible yet, but, you know, more than likely it's probably light. Yeah. I'm going with momentum because that four, that'd be radical flight. Yeah, I'm going momentum. I'd rather have momentum than speed because what speed kills, and the problem with speed is if you're not clean with it, you can shoot a real ragged shot. Oh yeah. So, so I think you're better off with the momentum thing and accuracy, which I think will come with it, versus shooting one of these high tech 400 feet a second bows with a five inch brace size that's about as unforgiving as your grandmother. <laughs> you know, it's just terrible. You know, and that's my belief. All right. I, I think there you can yeah. go over the top. So okay. momentum. Momentum. Both mom that's what I would have done too. All right. So, um, you can pick Illinois or Michigan or wherever you're hunting, but would you rather hunt the first three weeks or the last three weeks of season? So the first 21 days or the last 21 days, last 21 days. If it's cold, well, you don't know you're, you're going into season. It's like July and you got to pick, you know, are you going to hunt the first three or the last three? Last three, last three, getting out of food, getting in between, thermal bedding and food nice yeah all right would yeah. you rather shoot a clean these are both clean no junk no extras a 180 inch 10 point or a 160 inch 8 point i've got some i've shot some big eight points i go 180 inch 10 i've killed some big eights i haven't killed 160 inch 8 but i've killed close to 150 oh yeah when it was super I, hot. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. that's a giant eight point, 160 inch. That's well, that's not tiny big, but that's big. That's that's a very rare deer, 160 <laughs> inch eight point. You're lucky to get 140 inches out of an eight point. So that's a real special deer. I think it's still for me. I'm with Mike. <laughs> it's more to get that big 180 inch ten point is probably most people's desire and i guess i'm in that category too all right so what if i change it instead of a 180 to a 170 does that change your answers at all it's 170 <laughs> inch 10 or a 168 or does it why'd stay the do, same why'd you do that um we've both killed almost 170 inch 10s yeah I, I'm going to reverse that. <laughs> I'm going to take this very special deer, 
this 160 inch, I think that's what you still said it was. Yeah, 160. Yeah. Hey, because that's a very special deer. Not a, a lot of guys will ever shoot that deer. And uh, I'm sure that's the case with the 180 10 point or 170. But um, that's what I think. Yeah. All right. So this, this I'm, one's. I'm going to go. I'll go 170 10. I'll be different. All right. This one's a little bit easier. Would you rather have 50 pounds of deer summer sausage or 50 pounds of deer jerky? Summer sausage. Summer sausage. Oh, really? All right. I'm the same way. I love summer sausage. Next- I love jerky. I, I make jerky almost every couple of weeks, but I'll, dude, some jalapeno and cheese, man, that's hard to beat. Yeah. Hey, amen. Two more here for you, boys. Would you rather kill a 350 inch bull elk with a rifle? Or a 150 inch 10 point whitetail with a bow? 150 inch with a bow. Yeah, I'm with the bow. Wow. The bow. All right. Sticking to your guns, <laughs> pun intended. <laughs> and then last one Would you rather hunt all season in Michigan with your bow or two weeks in Illinois? Two weeks in Illinois. Two weeks in Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. We both- we both grew up. I mean, we've hunted all over here, and we got we got some good private land in Michigan. We've hunted. I don't know how many bucks we've killed on state land, public land. They don't call it state land anymore. It's just public. They call it public. Public land. It, no, they don't even say land anymore. It's just public. Yeah, we have so many hunters here. It's it's crazy. I mean, the gun season. They put out. We spoke, I think it's a couple of battalions or something. We got seven hundred fifty thousand gun hunters. Battalion. <laughs> brown down. If it's got antlers on it, it's dead. We got this just personal opinion here, <laughs> Governor. Oh God. We're, we got no we got, we're not we doing two, two bucks here. <sighs> so it's ridiculous. You know, we can shoot two bucks as little as three points on three inches on one side. So just to feel successful and say you shot a buck, people shoot these ridiculously small deer. <laughs> And it's just annoying to people. So, yeah, you want to get on a you want to get on a passing deer co- podcast one day. Call him. Oh man, I, all I know this is that uh, you guys have an open invitation. You guys are up in Illinois, and you're you're just beating it and you can't catch a break. Come up a little bit further north. I'll get you guys set up. I I would love to share some deer camp beers or whiskey with your dad, Mike. I feel oh, like yeah. I would be rolling the whole time. Hey, he gets wild, boy. We got a little wild last night, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> we got in trouble, though. Yeah. The wife's got us. Mom says, you smell like whiskey, and I said, so what? <laughs> <laughs> oh. We do more fun than barrel monkeys in a hunting camp. We, oh. we do. It's, and he always kills a giant right off the bat. I don't yeah, I've been it. lucky. I, I just, you know, we haven't been hunting good ground for that long. And to shoot the deer we've shot so quickly, I think it's, Good. I can remember just a closing thought telling my father, I will never pay to hunt. He said, son, you're going to pay to hunt someday. I said, no way in hell am I going to pay to hunt. Now we've had leases for, was it four years? Five years. Yeah. 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 And paying, paying to hunt. Outfitters and paying outfitters and just spending money like we're fools. Yeah. But you can, like, you can do it. On- to make up for it <laughs> well you know what though man like a couple things first off is not all ground is equal and people kind of don't, don't get that you know um they don't and well, what, must be nice, dude you know how much i hear that must be nice to have a job where you can hunt and have good access to land and i'm like let me tell you something we worked at it. <laughs> yeah you know you gotta we're, you we're, gotta bust your damn ass to to a have the ability to pay to play but then you got to bust your ass to find the right piece. Just because you bought, just because you have a lease, doesn't mean it's going to hunt for shit at all. Doesn't oh, mean it's it... like when people buy land when people buy ground, and they're like, "Oh, I'm going to kill a giant back here." You know, it's like you got you got to know the neighborhood you're buying in, and you got to know the neighborhood that you're hunting in. You got to do a little little bit of homework. But it's people people always just want to take the easy way out of everything. And you still have to be a good hunter. Just because you have yeah. access to good ground, does that help? Absolutely. People you fall got, into big deer every year. Here. Yeah, that's why I will listen to him over anybody. When even these new guys, and just I mean, you put thread across the goddamn deer trail to see if deer were walking by. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah I mean, I don't know, man. It's he that oh that new. There's such a 
we t- we did a podcast on the outdoor industry and social media and all that. What two years ago now? Yep, yep, Dude, we sure did. And it's gotten so oh my gosh, it, it hurts. It makes me I want to throw my phone through walls sometimes. <laughs> it, yeah, it, and unfortunately, I feel like it's probably going to get a little worse before it gets better. Uh, kind of oh, like a lot of things in our country, but that's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> We're not jumping on that. <laughs> no, no, yet. we don't need you. We don't need the blood pressure to rise. That'll here. be it. That'll be it in camp drinking beers around a fire talk. Amen. Yeah. Amen. But yep. any closing statements from either of you gentlemen? You got anything? Closing statement. Um, just something for the listeners. Give, give somebody a little motivation on hunting and shoot get, real quick. Get out and hunt. Take your family hunting with you. Take your kids. Take your wife. Take the neighbor. Get somebody into hunting because I think you'll develop some of the best bonds of friends that you've ever had through hunting. And uh, we have friends like we've met in deer camp that we're friends with now that we would have never met, yeah. like Mark Zona. You know? Yeah. If you guys, you know, who Mark Zona is no sir. He's a professional fisherman. He's got two shows on the Outdoor Channel. and He's on ESPN. Yeah. We were in camp with him. We were in camp with uh, Rocky Kozlo, the president of Hunter Specialties, yeah. vice president of marketing, Jason McKee. Yeah. Um, the guys from, uh, they were on a lease with us. Oh, Bo- yeah. Bo- Hunter died, yeah, Todd, Todd Graff. Graff. He was a lease partner of ours. He was a lease partner of ours. And you make some great friends. So get out and hunt and enjoy yourself because you never know when it's going to be your last hunt. So you just got to get out and do it. Yep. And uh, that's what I think. Yeah, same for me. Well and, said. Uh, yeah. Well, you boys, are you gonna are you gonna hunt tonight? Or are you just gonna lay low? No, uh, today it's actually well, it's four thirty here. Oh, it's shoot. almost dark. Today's the last day here. I've hunted a few times up here and. Uh, I got a little picky. I actually took out a gun for the first time in over a decade. Yeah. Yeah. I had a, I had a doe on my crosshairs at 35 yards and I just couldn't do it. I always wanted to kill a buck in Michigan with a crossbow and I wanted to kill a turkey. I've done both. So now I'm passing on the, the, um, the uh, crossbow to the family and, and let the them kids. let the grandkids hunt with it. Um, so that was a big deal. Hunted 19 days straight here in Michigan. I got a wonderful wife that doesn't care. How long have you been married this year? 54 years. 55. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just just a couple moons. Yeah. yeah. Jeez. Well, yeah. well, I'm excited to see your kids get into this, Mike. It'll be a cool oh, yeah. journey to watch. And uh, this, uh, I sure do appreciate you boys taking some time to talk to me. I'll make yep. sure and send you guys the links and. Other than that, just have a fantastic long weekend, and I'm sure I'll yep. talk to you both soon. Thank you again for your time, Ted. Yeah, man. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Garrett. Really enjoyed it. All right. See you guys. Talk All you right. Again. Take care, man. Have a good night. Man, what a couple of just knock out genuine dudes. Um, episode 174 is going to be an awesome one. I can't wait for this one to come out. And if you're still tuning in, I appreciate you sticking with us. We've got some great ones in the pipe. I'm not going to share just what yet, but we have a couple controversies lined up. Also going to be doing a lot of, well, not a lot, but several podcasts covering coyote tactics and shed hunting tactics. So now that the seasons are changing, um, we're into the new year with new goals, new tasks ahead of us. Uh, we're going to start sharing that and bringing some guests on that are going to be really relevant for late January, February, and early March. So as always, thank you for turning in. If you want to check out Mike Lemansky, like I said, Harvest Time Outdoors, he and his family, his his personal family and his father and his wife are just, they're awesome people. Um, I, I really am, am lucky to have gotten to know Mike as well as I am. Um, but it, like I said, if you want to check him out, he's on Instagram a ton. He's on YouTube, Harvest Time Outdoors. And other than that, as always, don't waste it.